All right, so our next speaker is Tal Sweet. He is the president and founder of the Marine Breeding Initiative. Um, he's been involved in the hobby since the late 80s and has spoken around the world on captive breeding. And his talk today is Captive Breeding, A Continuing Journey. Welcome, Tal. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Before I start, I just want to say, anybody that saw that I lost this, the hero of the hour is that guy right over there. <laughs> so, I didn't, I, it's the only room that I forgot that I was in, and there it was, but I know. Well, well he wasn't. Anyway, we, what did you do? Okay, so I've got a lot to cover today. We, I'm going to cram in 3,000 years of history into 40 minutes or less. And so let's just keep, you know, get going. Sorry. So we're going to talk about captive breeding, a continuing journey, starting as far back as I can get in history, but first of all, I'm going to probably miss something, and I'm probably going to forget somebody and not have them in here, and it's not my fault, it's not intentional, there's just so, so much I can fit into this time period. So in the past, we're going to cover where we began, where we are now, and where do you think maybe we're going to be in the future. The first freshwater aquaculture we can find kind of is in China, out of 1000 BCE, when we go to Rome, they start doing oysters and lagoons around 500 BC. Prussian carp, which eventually turn out to be goldfish, or are bred into goldfish, around 1000 CE. And then we're starting to see aquaculture pop up in Hawaii, Europe, and then you see the koi carp being uh, bred in Japan in the 1820s. Before 1950, many species were spawned for research purposes, but not really raised. It was just kind of to figure out what, what was going on. And back in China, you can see some, some of the artwork that they were doing that shows you, like the ponds that they were working with. And in Rome, the, the Emperor Tiberius, back around 30 CE, had these ponds cut out where they would actually aquaculture fish and things like that. And it wasn't really for like profit or anything, it was just something he wanted to do. They used them for food, fish, things like, like that. In the Middle Ages, in Europe, they're starting to do this more for food, fish as well, which is quite interesting. And also around the globe, you're getting the fish ponds in Hawaii, these things right here, and right through there. Those are par partially connected to the ocean for where they can get the inflow of the, the salt water, but that's actually saltwater fish we're talking now. The Victorian era is where it gets really crazy. I don't know if anyone's researched any of the tanks that they have back then, but like the one in the middle here is actually a bird, like, I don't know, bubble, where the birds from the bird cage can go up inside there and swim around. But at that point, the first, actually, public aquarium, this right over here, is in Regent's Park in London in 1875. And back then they were doing all their tanks were basically real ornate, but used um, just plate glass, um, sealed with pitch, and not much diversity with them. So before 1950 to 1965, it was basically very freshwater dominant. Um, it wasn't really doing anything with the ocean fish. There was a lack of understanding with salt water, how to work with it. They didn't understand the larval requirements. Um, freshwater fish are basically benthic spawners, where saltwater fish are mostly pelagic spawners, if we didn't understand the difference of that yet. Most aquarists back then were not even biologists, much less marine, marine biologists. So it was just basic scientists kind of playing around with fish. 
there are a lot of support issues. The, the technology wasn't there. They didn't understand the chemical properties of the ocean yet, nutritional factors for the, the fishes, the planktonic larvae. They didn't know what to do with them. The lighting the flow that's necessary for them, they didn't understand that yet. But they were starting to work on it. So now zooming into the 1960s, it was kind of a crazy era, as we all know. We're going to start out with what I'm calling the Fab Three. And we're going to hear a lot about these guys for a while. Um, it's Martin Moe, Frank Hoff, and Tom Frakes. And if you probably recognize Martin Moe, it's right back there. <laughs> hey, Martin. And Frank Hoff, who's no longer with us. And Tom Frakes. I don't know if Tom's here or not. I don't think, I don't think so. Hmm? Okay. And there was two other people that were kind of in this, in this group as well, which is Chris Turk, who's now with V2O Foods, and Forrest Young with Dynasty Marine. So they had a kind of an interesting relationship. They're all basically trying to breed fish, okay? Or understand this concept. And they're all connected to that ideal. So you have Martin Moe down in St. Petersburg, kind of, kind of like the, on the top of the wave of what's going on here. And then if you follow the blue lines, you have Tom Franks and, I'm sorry, not the blue lines, that's the aqua lines going to, Tom Franks and Frank Hoff are connected in St. Petersburg. Down in the Keys, you've got Forrest Young and Martin Moe connected. And then the blue lines, Chris Turk's connected to Tom Franks, but Martin Moe, Frank Hoff, and it's kind of really complicated. <laughs> they just, it's really, really complicated. So Martin Moe's down there in the 1960s, and I found these pictures from the um, Marine Research Laboratory. And I'm kind of like wondering, what's with the hacksaw, and you know, what's, and so what they're doing is working on the age growth and reproduction of the red grouper. So I guess you need a hacksaw to hack them up because they must be really tough fish. So but there, there was a lot going on down there at that uh, Florida Marine Research Laboratory in St. Petersburg. So who was there? Martin was there from 1959 to 1969. Frank was there from 1966 to 1969. And Tom Frakes was there from 1970 to 1940. I'm sorry, 1970, 1974. And Martin and Frank were working on the taxonomy of over 300 uh, Gulf of Mexico fishes. 25,000 of them through those years were measured and examined, classified. And a pilot program for raising um, black sea bass in Pompano was started. And Tom Frakes is working with freshwater shrimp with Charles Dugan, working with rotifers, copepods, algae, and stuff like that. Also, in between 69 and 71, preliminary work was starting with um, plankton dynamics at, in San Diego and also with rotifer cultures. And with a, um, I'm sorry, with a uh, culture from that sent out to Florida, that's where they started working or getting more, um, I'm sorry, more success with the Pompano. But in 1964, William Kelly from the Cleveland Aquarium started a little company called Aquarium Systems, and their first product was Instant Ocean, which if any of you have walked around here, you probably know what Instant Ocean is. And it's still being used today as one of the most popular salts in the world. So these are the Florida Pompano, down in the right 69, 72. Um, the eggs, the large um, adult fish in the 1970s. This is where it's going to get really complicated because there's a lot of people giving me a lot of information and there's some discrepancies of who was actually where, when, and what. But I tried to get it down as possible or as close to possible as I could. But new on the scene, very important right now, is there a better understanding of the, how to use biological filtration. It's not just throw the water in the tank and chemically filtrate it or mechanically filtrate it using um, biological filtration. And a big one here with our tanks, remember the Victorian area tanks were all sealed with pitch. They had metal frames, that, which is not real good with salt water, they had slate bottoms. Now we have silicone. 
so you can make tanks bigger, better, more stable seams and everything. So we have a lot better things to work with. Commercial airlines, and I'm putting quotes, more reliable um, shipping of livestock because they were not even reliable today. But back before then, it was very unreliable for shipping, so we couldn't bring things in from around the world as easily as we could before, or could back then. And mariculture by governments and private enterprises are working a lot on food fish at this point. They're starting to see the benefits of like actually raising fish for food and doing it. And advances in marine fish foods, more gel-based diets, um, fish foods that um, take into account the needs of the actual saltwater fish instead of just using freshwater foods. Now, these are some, these, there's going to be five Eurekas here that from Martin, thank you very much. Um, the rotifer comes on the scene in 1970, which leads to the work with the pompano being much more successful. It's a food that they could actually have it eat as a first food, and we're still using them today. In the early 1970s, Martin and Chris meet at Ocean, Oceanography Mar Culture Industries, OMI. In 74, um, Tom Franks works at Florida Marine Research Lab, working with freshwater shrimp at Charles Dugan, and they're working with um, Frank on the Pompano and sea bass. Martin stops his work on Pompano in 1971, and then he starts working with our favorite clownfish in 1972 in our garage, like a lot of us have here garage, basement, things like that. But in Florida, you don't have basements, so you use your garages. And in 72, Chris Turk graduates from Dartmouth and starts working on pompano. And pompano is a real popular fish. I'm not exactly sure if it's a really good, tasty fish. I've never actually eaten it, but yeah, so. Now, in 1972, Martin Moe's first Ocellaris spawn. And it looks like, I'm sure any of you people that are reading things and know the blacked out um, spawning tanks that we've been using for since then. Same type of setup, kind of everything thrown around. We're all used to that. Well, you too, Kathy, your basement. <laughs> in the fall of 72, he has his first success in his garage. You can see the little eggs on the, the ruler here. And at that time, he was still using an enemies in the tank. In 1973, there's more about Martin Mo. He was a busy, busy guy. <laughs> and he started increasing production with his clownfish. And they were selling from 35 to 70 cents, if I remember correctly. But a couple of different people said different prices, but pretty cheap compared to what we can get, like, like $7 now for them. And you, oh, he opens uh, Aqua Life Research to. Um, up his production and also starts working with Neon Gobies. Frank Hoff and Tom Frakes and Chris Turks are also working on Phyto and Zooplankton, which is, will come into play as we move along. And these are the first tank raised clownfish at a show like this back in 1973. So we have a lot to thank these guys for, or we wouldn't have shows like this. And in the news, it also ended up in magazines. In the, you can tell the photography wasn't quite as good as publications are now, like Coral Magazine doesn't, looks a lot better than that, wouldn't you say? <laughs> so, continuing with Aquilife Research in the middle years, from 72 to 75, um, he had two more because how to avoid um, toxic shock syndrome and using chlorine treatments to deal with um, sterilization problems with new waters and things like that. And, um, I'm sorry. We're moving on to the 1970s. Instant Ocean Hatcheries is a, started by Frank as an offshoot of Instant Ocean. And in here, in his book, he says he's working with clownfish and angelfish. And Matt asked me, he's like, was it freshwater or saltwater? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it was saltwater at that point. And Tom Frakes was there too. But there, working with perfecting plankton ring techniques to up the, the scale to a commercial level. Oops. And this one's shaky too. I'm not sure if Frank was here or not, but um, Tom was working at Open Neptune Nurseries and was working around clownfish, clownfish and gobies. In 75, Martin 
produces um, propagating the landing neon goby, which is probably one of the first um, articles of its kind back then. And Martin finally has raised Ocellaris, Frenatus, and Clarky clowns. So that's three species of clowns by 1975. And he starts working with the French and Grey Angels using wild-caught wild spawning, sp spawning pairs. That's a tongue twister. We go out and get the wild pairs that were spawning and bring them in, or ready to spawn, bring them in and induce them to spawn, take the eggs and work with them from there. So that's the French and Grey Angel fish. <clears throat> in 79, Barbara Planko was the first one to raise them from wild collected eggs. So he, she would collect the eggs and actually raise the, the French angelfish. And by 1976, Martin adds in the maroons, the red saddlebacks, the cinnamon clownfish, and a hybrid of the red, red saddlebacks and tomatoes. So oh, that's like one, two, three, four, five, six species by the mid 70s. Now, one thing I found very interesting is even back then, or I should say back then and now, there's a lot of competition between companies doing the same thing. And this was an area in 1974 to 75 where you've got Martin Moe and Chris Turk working for Aqualife Research and Instant Ocean Hatcheries with Frank Hoff and Tom Frakes right down the street, trying to do the same thing, working with similar fish, in the same neighborhood, and there's a bar called the Sunrise Tavern, and they have Friday nights. And what do people do on Friday nights? Well, they go out and have a few burgers and beers, you know, and I think it was Tom, or Frank and Tom were having some issues that Martin was kind of conquering, and Chris was trying to get them to and I kind of talk and share things. And eventually things came around and they did start to share things, which was really, really good. And I wish more people would do that now. And, but I thought the Friday night thing, a couple beers, I get them talking and they finally were working more on sharing stuff. Now in the late 70s, Chris accepts his position at Hubs. So he goes from Florida to San Diego. And he starts a research and development project a spawning or breeding situation like you would see in a lot of the aquariums around Long Island. Um, a lot of the aquariums will have these little things stuck in the back to like play around with spawning. The, what Todd worked at in Long Island was like everything was like crammed into like the smallest spot and I went to um, Sea Life in Michigan the other day and they have this huge area I'm like oh my god these guys got so much room but they have too many regulations to use it but anyway. Um, they were working on captive breeding back then, and they were trying to um, breed things in captivity to sell the local stores and the wholesalers and importers in LA, which were in the area. So Tom, um, still working at Instant Ocean, has raided eight, eight species of uh, clownfish by then and neon gobies, and works. It was at that time was the largest hatchery in the world. I'm sorry, commercial hatchery in the world, producing 60 to 80,000 fish a year, which back then was quite a few. I mean, that's like 20, 30 years ago now. I hate to date that, but. Um, 77 SeaWorld Marine Institute, first time breeding of Atlantic yellowhead jawfish. And um, Martin was doing it at the same time, and they were also doing Garibaldi out there, but those were, they were collecting the eggs from the ocean. And Forrest Young and Mount Row, at Aqualife, um, Angelfish Tech goes from experimental to production. They finally got to the point where it's the, what they've experimented with is actually working. So they can actually start uh, producing more. And uh, the Royal Gramas, they have had success with that, but there's no si uh, financial reasonability to do it. It's, it's just, it's still too expensive at that point. And commercial production of French and Grey Angelfish uh, aqua, aqua Life Research is going well now in the, on a commercial level. And at this point, they've moved to Marathon Key you know, between 75 and 83. And this, this building is the only main building right here, up here. And I don't know who this, do we know who this is, Martin? And this person here? They used to dress like that when they worked in the, you know, the hatcheries back then. 
So you can kind of look like it. It's what a lot of things still look like today. I mean, just rows of tanks. And through the eight years of ancient fish culture, they had success of doing it, but once again, there was no economic success. They weren't, it was too expensive to do any, raise these fish to you know, make it vi viable financially. So although they learned how to do it, they couldn't continue it because it was too expensive. So the last two Eurekas that Martin uh, shared with us, um, they would only eat live copepods, or copepod noplii from wild plankton. And they would only, the angelfish would only live if they treated with antibiotics in the tanks, which is unfortunate, but that's what it takes. Now into the, into the 1980s, <laughs> stop it, I like the 80s. <laughs> yeah, well that's what it was back then. <clears throat> Sib Crawl in Hawaii starts collecting this copepod called Irotima, or uh, whatever, read it, in Kaneohe Bay and starts using them to lay, raise larvae as a first food. And that, that is, will be important a little while later on here. And uh, January of 81, Martin, Frank, and Chris do something that I think more people should be doing today as well. I mean, some do it, but don't. But get together, if they're, you're having the same problems, get together and talk about it and fix it, even if it's your competitor. You know, everyone's so worried about money and like somebody else winning out, but if you share what you have, you might learn something and it's betterment for everyone involved. And in the summer, SeaWorld shuts down that little thing that they had going with the R&D in the back. So, because it was, um, they were having problems with, the, with finances and for the whole aquarium at that point. And Aqua Life Research is sold and moves to Walker K in the Bahamas and Forrest Young opens Dynasty Marine, which at that point is mostly, mainly collection, but some aquaculture. And Frank's um, Hoffman's Florida Aqua Farms, which if it's still around today, if you need any algae discs and plankton raising equipment, things like that, that's pretty much your go-to. Anything for invert feeds, like for clam feeds, for feeding, probably, um, Rotifers, copepods, different things like that. He was a pioneer. In 19, um, 1984, Instant Ocean shuts down, so it's no longer there. It's still doing the salt, but they had too many disease issues. It wasn't profitable. It was just, just didn't work. <laughs> and then pops on the scene in 1986 is Joe Lichtenberg up in the suburbs of Chicago, and he raises his first nine clownfish in his basement. I don't know. It's we always have like small numbers, first one, first nine, and that's what gets us going. But for Martin, or for, I'm sorry, for Joe, it was his first nine. And Frank Hoff starts Aquaculture Supply Company, which is providing products and stuff for people trying to, ra or pr companies or people raising allergies, phytoplankton, things like that. It's the, the, the hardware stuff for that. And Martin, in 1987, leaves Aqualife Research. And Bill, Bill Addison, who we probably all know, started Sequest after he retired from what he was doing before, and that's in Puerto Rico. Now, the rest of Aqua Life Research is in 83 to 98, or 88, and looks like a little bigger facility this time, but I think part of that's a marina, so. Now, Sequest. Who hasn't heard of Sequest in here? Everybody's heard of Sequest? You haven't? Okay. What, do you, what does Sequest stand for? Does anybody know? I didn't know. Do you know? It stands for culture quality using experience and scientific technology. And I'm like, really? I didn't know that. So it was established in 1988 by Bill Addison, who was pretty much, it seems like kind of a genius kind of guy. He did a lot of different things worked in the mining industry, um, it, but like I said, he started this project when he retired. And it ended up being a 15,000 square foot main building, which you'll see a picture of in a minute, with um, 12,000 40 gallon tanks, I'm sorry, 1,200 40 gallon tanks. And they had 10 outdoor tarp areas. They had 20 to 30 300 gallon tubs. And at full production, they had 20 employees. They were produced, had 550 broodstock pairs, which I've had 
plenty with six. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to do 500. And they worked basically with clownfish, Red Sea Dottiebacks, and gobies. Now the Onyx Pecula, um, the Wyoming Whites, anything that sounds like, or that's from Sequest was named after a mineral or a stone. Um, onyx, obviously you know what Onyx is, it's a gem. Wyoming White is a type of marble, if I'm correct. And that throws back to his history in the mining industry. And that's Bill Addison right there. You can see the, the outdoor tarp areas here, the uh, indoor production areas around here, and that's his wife, Arlene. I think that's how he pronounces it. But uh, he was quite the guy. I wish I would have met him. He seems like a very interesting person. And in 1989, Julian Sprung is the first to raise the Mandarin Dragonette. And evidently, he didn't have a good camera back then because those aren't really good pictures, but he sent them to me, so I'm using them. <clears throat> and moving up to 1990s, now that a lot happened in the 90s, like compared to the 70s. It's pretty, pretty quiet, but things did still happen. Don't do that. Joe Lichtenberg starts uh, reef pop propagations and he's selling 12 different species at this point of clownfish and neon gobies now, out of his house in Chicago still. And in 94, I'm sorry, the Breeders Registry was formed um, by Stanley Brown, Joyce Wilkerson, Ron Schimmick, and Tom Lang. He didn't put himself in there, but he's part of that too. And in 95 to 98, Todd Gardner over here is at Sequest. Dottiebacks, Gobies, and Akarshatansa production was his main focus back then, as well as trying to limit um, anti antibiotics, where they were using a lot of down there. He was trying to like, you know, cut that back a little bit. In 95, at Magnet in Louisville, the Banga Cardinal fish had been around a little bit before, but someone uh, brought it back up, and that was Gerald Addis, and by, or I'm sorry, Gerald Allen, writing an article about it, and it just like exploded. Everybody wanted to have this fish, and it was like great, but then it, cre it created such a strong demand that people were, they were just being harvested like just too much. And he kind of had a regrets from like making such a big deal about it because it did start having problems with the, uh, the native populations. And in 1995, Frank Marini, Dr. Frank Marini um, was the first one to breed the Van Guy Cardinal. And 95, 96-ish, Aqualife Research shuts down. Martin receives the first, or his uh, Mazna Award. And Tom Frakes in 96. So we, you're seeing a lot of breeder-centric people winning the Mazna Award. 96, Orchid Dottiebacks. Bill Addison is uh, the first to raise the Orchid Dottiebacks, along with uh, Robert Bronze in Israel. So it's interesting how people on opposite sides of the world, it's a little more going on technological now, but even back years ago when um, Martin was working on one thing and San Diego was working on something and it just happened to get it right at the same time, even though they're not even close together. And then in 97, people have heard of Joyce Wilkerson, I think, and she starts visiting Sequest down in Puerto Rico. and. Um, what I found out was, well, I'll skip to that, but it's more interesting later. And Karen Britton is working in Hawaii at the uh, Waikiki Aquarium and breeds the, breeds the first hippocam hippocampus fisheri. And in the late 90s, what's happening is there's really starting to be a real serious push um, by seahorses, um, or I'm sorry, not seahorses, successes, it's, um, or a, an ocean rider are actually producing them consistently then. And one thing that happens next is the World Wide Web. So we've gone from books and talking, you know, letter writing, uh, newsletters and things. We've got the internet, listservs, things I didn't even heard of because I wasn't really even into it back then. But that's opened up a whole new world to share technology and share what you're doing. And it, it's just, gotten insane since then. And so now I'm going to kind of go by person through their careers instead of going through years because there's getting to be too many people going on. But back in, we're looking at, everyone knows Rod's food. He started out in the 90s, started breeding clownfish at home, and 
he ended up starting a coral business in 1998 and got, if anyone's seen his logo, the Mama Clownfish, that's a Sequest fish from them. And at that point, the first Papa was too, I think. And then he starts his uh, own food, started making his own food at home. It goes commercial in 2006. And then in 2011, he creates the Breeders Blend, which I kind of like to think I helped him out because I'm kind of talking, I'm like, why don't you do a Breeders Food? Do a Breeders Food. And then there was a Breeders Food. So <clears throat> I mentioned the Breeders Registry before. I put this in here because they have a very interesting tagline. I, you can read the courtship mating sex. If they do it in your tank, we want to hear about it. Okay. <laughs> but it was basically getting people sharing their information on how they bred things and creating a database of different spawning um, habits, everything, the successes, and sharing it with everybody, which I'm a real big fan of. And it was all run by a uh, volunteer staff. And it basically now, it's archived, but it's still available for use. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next people are Ocean Breeze and Aquariums, ORA. And when Aqualife Research shuts down, ORA is established in 96. A lot of the, they took over a lot of the um, equipment and brew stock from there and moved to the Harbor Branch Institute. Or, or, I, or I, at that one point was the private company for a short time, but then they partnered with Harbor Branch and Harbor Branch assumed control and making it for, a for-profit company for a non-profit research institute, which, yeah, okay. In 2011, or, Aurora was sold and is now still a privately owned company. In 2013, over 10 million fish have been produced, and they have produced 125 species, 14 hybrids of fish and inverts, and 200 coral varieties in Florida as well. And they've raised approximately 400 species, or 400 species first. I'm, let me go back there. 40 species first. And as a look at their facility, they have just awesome fish. The, the, Breeding set up in here, nice view from the outside at night, but just beautiful, beautiful fish, which is a main thing with uh, producing captive fish, captive bred fish is having good quality fish. Now, through the late 90s or 80s, 90s, we're getting to see more books. This book, Dr. Thresher's book, Reproduction of Reef Fishes, it's very technical, very scientific based. A lot of it says, yeah, it goes through species by species, how they spawn in the wild, their eggs and stuff, but it's not a lot of actual breeding processes in there because they haven't done it back when he was writing it. There's some, but not a lot. But there's a lot of information in there if you're a real science guy that likes to read through that. In 96, Frank wrote his book, The spawning, Conditioning and Spawning, Rearing of Fish with Emphasis on Marine Clownfish, which any clownfish breeder has probably read. And Martin's book on orchid dietybacks, which is one of my least favorite books because it, nothing good happens till the very end. <laughs> and it's, it's like you're down in Florida plankton towing every chapter and I'm in Michigan and it's like, I can't do that. But eventually in the end, it, it's a very interesting book, well worth reading. And in 98, jo Joyce Wilkerson White's probably the most iconic clownfish book. And then Martin, I'm sorry, Matt Rittenrich does the, his ultimate breeder's guide, Mouthful, the long title book, and the Bangai Cardinal Fish Guide comes out in 2013. Now, you've heard me talk about Joyce Wilkerson a few times. So, you know, she revolves around Sequest a little bit. She wrote a book. Um, a lot of people thought she, I thought she worked at Sequest. Um, she didn't, she volunteered there on her vacations. She went there and siphoned tanks and cleaned algae. <laughs> but she loved what she was doing, she was passionate about it. But I heard she was very shy. And so I started looking around for her and she is the like, hardest person, she has like no internet presence hardly at all. Her book, her obituary, which doesn't tell much about her. I found out she was an engineer by trade. She would get into um, 
things like breeding clownfish like this, or at one point she was breeding cats, or like some type of real exotic cats, but she would get in, get real heavy, and get out of it. And I thought, well, I gotta know who this person is. No pictures. I, I'm asking everybody I know online, it's like, do you have a picture of Joyce Wilkerson? And everybody's like, no, 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 finally. Dana Riddle, of all people, shows, sends me a picture, and that's Joyce Wilkerson in Richmond, Virginia. So you get a picture on your mind of what somebody looks like. Not what I was expecting, but that's her. So everyone knows what Joyce Wilkerson looks like now. Okay, moving up to the 2000s. Moving up to the 2000s. Okay. Uh, Frank, Frank Bench, who is our as not aquarist of the year this year, out in Hawaii, and starting Reef Culture Technologies. Which I think in the beginning was a lot of work with um, wild collected eggs and or um, raising larvae from that, or wild collected larvae as well. And Pro Aquatics has started. In 2001 and 2003, okay, Sid Crawl we mentioned earlier with the copepods in Kaneohe Bay. Frank Bench is there, Karen Britton's there. Um, Karen wants to take Sid out to harvest some copepods that she found, and he goes, she goes to the same spot where he was collecting the atupina, but they're not there anymore. Now it's parvocalinus copepods. So where the one went, we don't know. Karen is the first to breed the mask angelfish in 2002, <clears throat> which is a very beautiful fish. Todd starts working, I believe Sequest starts working at Long Island Aquarium. And 2004 is very important because seahorses are listed in Appendix 2 of the CITES Convention. So it's pushing heavily for captive breeding of seahorses. Bali Aquas, which starts in 2004, starts breeding clownfish. And seahorse source is started by Dan Underwood and his wife Abby down at Fort Pierce. And 2006, Sustainable Aquatics is founded. And Kathy Leahy starts Kathy's Clowns. I'm kind of adding some like hobbyist breeders in here too, so I'm just not doing scientists or commercial organizations, because I think everybody should get a little bit involved here. In 2007, MoFib was started, the Marine Ornamental Fish and Invert Breeders website, which is similar to Breeders Registry. And Joe Lichtenberg closes down after, what, 19 years, he produced 226,000 fish sold primi primarily to wholesalers. And Sustainable Aquatics starts their Sustainable Islands project, where they can get tank-conditioned fish to work with for broodstock. And in 2009, the Marine Breeding Initi Initiative is created. And in 2009, the Rising Tide Foundation, or Rising Tide Con Conservation begins with SeaWorld. Frank Bench again, I asked him what his couple of his favorite firsts were. He had 27 species for, or 27 species raised, 17 first, and his, these were his two favorites, and I kind of agree, they're beautiful, beautiful fish. A little bit about Pro Aquatics, they started out with clownfish, ended up working with the Olden Trevelys and uh, Lookdowns, they came out a couple years ago, really stunning fish at Magda. First profit, they started in 2001 and weren't profitable to 2011. So that gives you an idea how long it takes to get going a lot of times. Sea and Reef Aquaculture, Soren Hansen, works with basically, as far as I know, clownfish, dotty backs and cardinal fish. But his, and his hybrids, all of his hybrids are named after um, storm, well, weather conditions. So Maine Blizzard, the new one that's come out that's here this year is the Black Storm. So everybody, all the hybrids are kind of giving different names, like the onyx was the stones, and sea and reef is weather conditions. Um, Dan Underwood down in, Fort, or down in Florida is one of the two oldest companies producing seahorses in the United States. The other would be Ocean Rider in Hawaii, but they're not just one or two people working in their house of doing it. 2008, Matt Pearson raises the orange file orange spotted file fish and wins the 2009 Mazin Award. What's interesting about this is what I said earlier, saying about sharing information. He shared everything about this. I, you know, if anyone knows him, he shares everything anyway. But 
people are often worried about if you share information, it's going to, you know, you're going to lose the money. Well, no one's ever done it since, so there's no reason why not to share the information. So the Marine Breeding Initiative, which is very close, close to my heart, is the sister project of the Marine Life Aquarium Society of Michigan. It was modeled after the Breeders, um, uh, Re Breeders Registry, MOFIB, and the Florida Marine Aquarium Society's Breeders Award Progr Program here, which is, I actually have this over here, this document from there. And we started the workshop where we bring people together and speaking about captive breeding to, to breeders, to industry um, professionals and that, and next year will be our 10th year of doing that. Rising Tide is a different type of foundation where they started in 2008 with a program at SeaWorld Sea Bush Gardens by uh, Dr. Ju Judy Lutter. And they work with um, different uh, groundbreaking uh, processes, um, aviaris work in Hawaii, um, supporting high school level edu um, education. In 2011 to 17, they've raised 29 species. 11 were species first. And they partner with University of Florida, Oceanic Institute, Pro Aquatics, Roger, Roger Williams University, I think Columbus Zoo. In 2010s, I've got a groove, don't I? Matt Rittenrich gets the uh, Madison Award, Sequest leaves Puerto Rico for Wyoming, Reed Mariculture O and TDO. If you don't know TDO and you're breeding fish, that's the good stuff. Um, Bi Biota starts in Palau, first captive bred list published by myself and Matt Pierce in Coral Magazine. At that point, we had 233 species. Jim Welsh becomes the first person to raise the Hawaiian flame pipefish. Todd receives the Mazna Award in 2013. Dr. Andy Ryan raises uh, the Ashagobi for the Roger Williams University New York New England Aquarium joint project. Kathy Leahy does Coral Beauty Angelfish. Poma Labs is started in 2017, which we just found out last year at this time with Nuri Fisher. And also Andy Ryan wins the Mazda Award. Karen Britton wins the Mazda Aquarius of the Year. And we published in 2018 Coral Magazine species list. We're up to 358 species. So that's like 125 more species in the tenth of time we've been doing it. And here's a little bit about Matt. He's one of my favorites as well. He was a really busy kid. He raised 18 species. 13 species by age 18. He wrote his book shortly later and opened Poma Labs with Mary Fisher early last year. Light and Maroon was real popular in 2012, kind of broke, shook everything up with crazy hybrid, or not hybrid fish, but crazy pattern fish. More on Todd Gardner here from Sequest all the way to the Long Island Aquarium in 2002. And he's bred, what are you up to now? Yeah, 55 and beyond. <laughs> but these are some of the most beautiful. The big one recently is the Cuban basslet, the Garama de Shanghai. And Andy Ryan, who's bred multiple things, working, he's the uh, associate professor of marine biology at the Roger Williams University. First figure fish in 2009, the Ashagoba in 2016. And Karen's Britain's been doing a lot of angelfish down there. It started with the seahorse, but it's doing more angelfish this time. Monica Schmuck, green, green chromas at the New England Aquarium. Sustainable Aquatics, they purchased a bigger building in 2006, which looks, it looks really nice, really pretty. I can imagine keeping everything so clean, but. And they started Pelagic Spawner Project in 2013 and acquired DT's um, Plankton Farm to help facilitate the plankton they needed to, for the Pelagic Project. It, they brought them in-house to do, take over that section. And this is kind of controversial, the long fin clownfish. Some people love it, some people don't. But that was in 2015. And then this year they released three different angelfish here. Biota and Palau Research and Education is their main focus. And it's the only fully aquaculture supplier of fish from the Pacific um, through, or for wholesalers through biota aquariums in Florida. And this was our, our coral list that we've done. 
I got a few pages there. These are uh, breeders with their species first, all the way from um, Karen's fish down to his blue tangs that Kevin Barton did. Jim's, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to go so fast. Jim's uh, Hawaiian flame pipefish were done in 2013 in our species first by a hobbyist and Kathy Lay's um, coral beady angelfish. And Martin Moe, he, I had asked him to speak for us a while back, and he said I, he's working on his uh, diadema project, and he had to call it a, anatomy of a failure or something like that. And I'm like, how can it be a failure? I mean, you've done so much work, and it's, it's, even though it didn't turn out the way you wanted, it's got the information out there. And there's now Jamie Craigs in, in the UK has carried on the work, and so I don't think anything's really a failure. This is some of the work that... Avier Montavo's work at Rising Tide, that's just his 2016 list. Some recent game changers have been some of the uh, copepods from Algagen. Larry's um, Who's Your Daddy Fertility Frenzy Food, and Reed Mariculture, Reef Nutrition's Apex Pods, the TDO, RG Complete for growing rotifers and a rotifer compact culture system. And finishing up with the big guys, Matt and Nuri's Poma Labs, they have produced nine species of angels so far, six being species first. So, the future. Some issues we're facing. This is where it kind of gets depressing. Climate change, ocean acidification, anti-aquarium groups, people shutting down collection through legislation, pollution, anti-science agendas, and all kinds of things. So I asked a bunch of people for different thoughts. I'm only going to give you four of them here. And just kind of, everyone has a little different take. The last one by Julian Sprung is kind of funny, which if you know Julian, he has a little, uh, little sense of humor. I'm um, talking about how lower, uh, it'd be lower heating costs because it would be warmer. And <laughs> um. So basically, the future can go many ways, but we're looking at maybe this. I'd prefer that, which could easily turn to that, which really should be that. And that's just sad. So I don't know who this guy is, but I think he sums it up pretty well. So I want to thank you guys for having me. And if there's anything I missed that you want to know, let me know. I've got a pile of paper this big that has everything that I couldn't fit into here. And have a great Macna.